Well, welcome everyone to the second Southbury uh, webinar, reopening Southbury webinar series. Um, this one is focused on temporary outdoor dining and preparing your business for reopening. Uh, my name is Kevin Bielmeyer. I'm the Economic Development Director here, and uh, I want to welcome you again and let you know who we have uh, in in the house, so to speak. Joining me on this uh, web call, we have uh, Kathy Castaneda. She is our uh, new land use administrator for the town of Southbury. Uh, we have uh, Andy Ademis, uh, the owner of Senior Poncho's uh, restaurant chain, and we have Rob Laban of Laban's Markets and owner right here in Southbury of the Southbury Self Storage. So I thank them all for uh, for joining me. Um, so as I said, today we're talking about uh, a few things to do with tomorrow's uh, opening, which is uh, on May 20th, and that's when eligible businesses uh, may open. These include restaurants uh, for outdoor dining, uh, offices, retail and malls, museums, and schools, or zoos rather, not schools. <laughs> Some might say that, you know, schools are zoos, but we're not going to go there today. Uh, postponed, this is actually relatively new, is that hair salons and barbershops are postponed until uh, they're expecting early June. So that is not going to be happening tomorrow. Um, one thing I wanted to show you in our, in our resources uh, before we uh, go much further is that on our town page um, everything you're going to be hearing about uh, today and uh, and future resources that, that that come out from the state and from the federal government and certainly the municipal government we are including uh, on the website uh, in our business uh, section of uh, the website so if you're if you're at the home page let's go back to the home page here for the town of Southbury's website, you see the tab at the top business. That's probably the easiest way. You click on that and you come down here to business COVID-19, uh, COVID-19 business update, and you click on that. And, um, and by doing so, it takes you to the ongoing business update page where we uh, just continue to include uh, the latest and greatest information. Um, one of which being, uh, you'll see right here at the top, uh, Ned Lamont's latest executive order 7PP. Uh, which is uh, specifically dealing with the uh, the salons and and how the health department uh, plays a role in that. Um, so if you are looking for resources, this is a good spot to go to. We're, we're continuously updating this pretty much daily uh, with the latest information. Um, as, if you are one of the businesses eligible to reopen, uh, you definitely want to check out uh, the downloadable guidelines by sector. So this is found on the state page. Um, the web link to that is right there at the top. Uh, and again, I'm going to be providing all these links in a follow up document after this webinar is over uh, to all those that participated. Um, but this is where you'll find the sector rules and certification process for tomorrow's opening. So again, you'll see hair salons, museums, zoos, etc. Um, well, that's actually really June. But this is where you find the the nitty gritty details on what is required um, for your sector if you wish to open. Let me reiterate, you don't have to open. Nobody has to open tomorrow on May 20th. This is just permissible by uh, the state government if you follow these guidelines. Each one is, is really lengthy, um, so we're not gonna go, go through them all in detail, but you can certainly read about it. Uh, today, we're really interested in sort of a more of a real world uh, view of what this means to, to open. Um, but if you are in any of these categories and you're interested in opening, do go through them and read them in detail. Um, part of that is included included in this is that you must self-certify. So uh, if you want to open tomorrow and you are one of those eligible businesses and you go through that the guidelines by sector, um, you also want to come to this link uh, on the town on the state website business.ct.gov recovery, and that's where you find this button here, self-certify now, and you click on that. Um, and that will take you through the self-certification process, um, which um, uh, one of our uh, guests today, Andy, probably could speak to because I'm sure he's gone through that. Um, also, notice below it the Small Business Reopening Resource Guide. Uh, this is a relatively new link, I think, in just the last day or two. Um, so you want to click on that for uh, all the latest resource guide information. And then notice actually just above that, it says, is your business eligible to reopen now? Check here to find out. And by clicking on that, it will it'll answer that question. Well, let's go ahead and click on it while we're here. 
And as you see, it takes you back to the latest executive order and uh, and the, that same sector page. So it's basically just a, a, a loop in case you go to one site, it takes you to the other and vice versa. So, um, all this reopening process, if you click on each of those guidelines, it takes you to essentially this page, which is reopen Connecticut, which is uh, the, the arm of uh, Connecticut focused on this reopening process. And this is where it lays out in a very, you know, easy to read graphic design of uh, how to uh, to follow these sector rules. So as you click on each of those sector uh, categories for those rules, it'll pull up a document like this. So you'll see as I scroll down, it gets to restaurants uh, outdoor only. And this is where it has the details from the state on those reopening guidelines for uh, for restaurants. But as you're going to uh, here this morning, um, it's, you know, it's not so cookie cutter. I mean, it's not one size fits all uh, by any means. Um, what we wanted to do with the town, and this is the executive board I spoke about, what we wanted to do with the with the town is make uh, this process of uh, reopening for restaurants that wish to. Um, let's I'm gonna stop sharing, come back to me. We wanted to make it um, as easy as, as possible and as, as swiftly as possible. I mean, we literally just found out, I think, last last week sometime, early last week, um, that uh, how the that the permitting process and things like that were going to be basically left to the town, which um, I think was a was a good call. Again, one size does not fit all what were the state to dictate what the what every single town out of 169 municipalities should do is uh, is a little crazy. So um, to help facilitate and speed up the process, they left it to each municipality to, to handle it as they wish. So um, that's why I have Kathy uh, Castaneda joining us uh, this morning. She's our new land use uh, administrator. And uh, I'm going to uh, just share something real quick here. There is uh, Kathy. And I am at this time going to turn it over to Kathy to talk about our uh, temporary permit process for outdoor dining. So Kathy, take it away. Okay. So Kevin, as Kevin had explained, um, Executive Order 7MM instructed towns to create a very simple process to allow restaurants to either modify or expand or allow outside dining at their food service facilities. So we created this very simple form. I don't know if Kevin's going to put up the form. That might be helpful. Um, that it's just very simple. Applicant, name of your location, phone number, contact info, no fee associated with it. You fill out this form. Um, with an attached site plan sketch of how you're going to do your outside dining, how many tables you're going to have. It's got to comply with the um, the sector rules. In other words, the tables six feet spaced apart and some other standards. Um, and then we just have a few simple things on there about it. The, the, the seating should not block fire lanes or building egress. Um, can't impede any necessary parking. But a lot of zoning is pretty much thrown out the window here. And we're just, if we don't approve it within 10 days, it's automatically approved. Um, so we just made it a very simple, very, very simple process. So I, I don't see the form up there, Kevin. Do you guys see it or? Oh, I thought it was there. I'm I'm looking at it, but maybe yeah. I'm not seeing in a second. All I see is you and Andy. I apologize for that. Let me, uh, let me share it. I thought we were looking at it. How about now? No, I don't see it. Anyway, it's available on, on the websites. Um, or if anybody needs it, they can contact us at the land use office. But it's just a very simple, quick process. We'll go out and look at where you want to put your tables, and we'll say, fix this, fix that, go for it, and um, sign off for you so you can get open. How about now? Yeah, there it is. Okay, excellent. Um, as you can see, it's it's just it's for temporary till this uh, health emergency or until the executive orders are changed, and you can have your inside dining again. Um, so just a few, little bit of information there, and just a little sketch of how you're going to do it, and email it back to us. We'll get out there right away and figure it out with you, and um, uh, it should be just simple. And we'll make sure that it's. We'll ensure that it's safe and um, uh, 
Okay. Can you hear me, Kathy? Yep. Okay. So as you see, and then on the second page of the permit application, there is, we did, you did include the executive order that you spoke to, the 7MM, um, how liquor service is currently being uh, handled. And I think uh, Andy even has an update on that. Um, again, those sector rules for restaurant reopening that we showed you earlier is the link is there. Uh, and also this uh, information on how the building department uh, is handling uh, tents that may be in, uh, restaurants may be interested in in setting up because we kind of are anticipating uh, that request coming in. So we have a little information there as well. Um, and Kathy, uh, where can they find this uh, this document again? It's on the town's, what, it actually it was on the part, you, it looks like you have a link to it on your business yes, part I do of have the a website, link but it's yep. on the town's website under zoning. It's right at the top, I believe. Okay. Or you can, or you can call or email. As well. Okay, and we'll provide uh, everybody's contact information at the end of this as well. Um, okay, and now I should say that we're going to take questions at the end of this. I know folks may have some questions. Um, at this time, I want to turn it over to uh, to you, Andy. Uh, to give us uh, sort of a real world perspective on, um, on doing outdoor dining or preparing to do outdoor dining, because I know it just starts tomorrow uh, with, with your restaurants. So, um, Andy? And you're, you're muted, sorry. Sorry, thank you. I was actually fortunate to already have a patio, so it made the process a little easier, but I did ask for an extension uh, to allow tables outside on the grass. Uh, as far as the process, uh, you know, I, I commend Kathy and the town. They did a wonderful job. They they flipped that permit within uh, 24 hours for me. Um, again, being a little easier, the layout was there. I understand that it might be a little tougher for somebody who's trying to put a tent up in the parking lot and how other restaurants are going to handle that. But uh, I, I did a sketch. Um, I'll show you a quick copy of that since I didn't have it ready, but the, I don't know if you can see this, but eight and a half by 11. Just to, it's kind of tough to see, but um, we just kind of did it on uh, Google and uh, sketched out the tables just to give them an idea. Uh, it shows some of the distancing and uh, it, obvious, like Kathy said, the egress, not blocking anything where I have my sanitation. And uh, I, I lost half of the tables on the patio, so normally we have 11 tables. I was able to put uh, six on the patio and three outside. So I still don't even have, uh, you know, and some of the tables are twos, which makes it even even less. But at least I'd rather have something better than nothing, and uh, everybody is excited about that. As far as moving forward with uh, opening outdoors, you know, there was, we've been trying to do some heavy training because I know some of my uh, friends who have uh, colleagues in other parts of st in other states, they've told me that they're struggling with uh, with restaurants opening because they're having a hard time adjusting to wearing gloves and wearing masks and stuff like that. So training is going to be important for all the restaurants here. And uh, I, rec I recommend that everybody handles the uh, training through ServeSafe, which is the uh, so it, it, it's a it's a 13 minute uh, video on ServeSafe. It's called the COVID-19 reopening video on Serve Safe, and it's all free. Um, to take Andy, that a little. Andy, what is that? Where did you locate that? Is that what you know happened into the website, by any chance? Servesafe.com. S-E-R-V-S-A-F-E.com. And, and all my employees have been doing it, uh, and they get a certification. It's a 13-minute video. What's good about that video? It shows them how the pathogens easily get transmitted. Because sometimes you may have people that don't truly understand how easy things can spread. So this kind of covers that topic uh, quickly and it shows them and it reviews uh, just main sanitizing. Um, I would go further if I was a restaurant owner to have everybody do the full food handler certification would cost one hundred and seventy five dollars now and it's free till the end of May. I used to pay for that for my staff and, and my wife gave me a great idea. She says, why don't you bring everybody in an hour early and slowly start letting them take half hour, you know, uh, 45 minute uh, 
take the course over time so they don't get killed for, for two hours, three hours sitting there. And it's cheaper for me to pay them per hour than to take them to a class or invite them to a class like we used to for an hour for $175. So, um, but Andy, let me interject. If you do that ahead. class, if you have it say on site for your employees, does somebody come in to teach that or is this, uh, how you is that? You could do it online. You could go to, you, you could go to uh, sites that have them or in, in some cases I used to put, I used to put them together and have 20 people and I used to bring the person to like uh, the prospect banquet room and they would, you know, they would, uh, it was more hands on that way for us. Yeah. But it's, it's free online till the end of May. It's a wonderful deal. So um, the, the thing on the COVID-19 video and we're stressing it is the mask, the gloves, the sanitation and the hand washing. And it's all new in the sense that, you know, I don't think an employee that's in the restaurant business has washed his hands 12, 15 times in an hour. And that could be a possibility now. Yeah, so they have to constantly be trained and told, especially a young person. They, they're not used to this. So the training is very important. And, and to me, the, the battle for the takeout and the restaurants are going to be one on how we make the customer feel. We need to make the customer feel very safe in that environment. When they're sitting down, when they're walking, it, when the bathrooms have to be spotless when they walk in. And that, that to me is my recommendation for restaurants or any business. You know, there's some businesses that are going way beyond and it makes me feel comfortable. You know, I don't care that you're going to take my temperature when I walk into your your place. That makes me feel good, you know, <laughs> that you go that far, that you're going to pay somebody to stand at the door, hand out sanitation napkins and take my temperature. You know, we're trying to have a person that strictly is what we call the sanitation person. Obviously, it's going to cost me more money until we figure this out, but they are responsible for constantly hitting the touch points of the restaurant throughout the entire restaurant. So they're just walking around hitting touch points, they're cleaning tables, and they're focusing on strict, strict sanitation of everything that a customer can touch. So, um, What about the difference between um, your different restaurants in different towns? Because I, I know you had said that you can't just sort of apply everything exactly the same to each of them there's differences but we noticed when we were making signage and this is where it's going to be unique for every individual restaurant when we were making the signages i was sitting there with my wife and, and we're trying to say okay we'll get three of these and well you can't get three of those because the layout is different over here and so every restaurant being that i have three every restaurant is going to have to look at it and tweak it to to make it work for them signage wise uh the the flow of traffic has changed you know now we're trying to do we're trying to develop entry and exits that we never had to do that you know so we're trying to make you come in one door and out another door um again just to keep the floor traffic if you're on the patio and there's no reason for you to come in if you don't have to go to the bathroom we want you exiting through the patio and stay out yeah let me ask you about that with the re with the restrooms how are the restrooms being handled obviously that's indoors so is that the only the sole exception of why someone is allowed inside well we have you waiting at the front door um the problem we're going to have is if it's you know if somebody doesn't want to wait there we're not going to let them in so they're going to have to make a decision are you going to line up six feet apart from each other that's taped off on the sidewalk because our plan is to greet you kind of give you the rules and then walk you around the grass area like uh, like on Peter Road and and come into the patio. That's that's the way we're handling it. Um, we think there's going to be a high demand to sit on the patio because you only have six. You only have uh, nine tables. Right. You know, and you, you're basically only seating uh, 18 people, 20 people. Do you think reservations are going to be more necessary than usual because of that? We must have got a call for between three restaurants, maybe 50, 60 people have called to make a reservation. I don't think that's a good idea. Um, right now, we're having a staffing issue. Uh, not, 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 not a staffing issue in that sense, but to stretch out uh, to the outside creates more, more staff. And right. you know, some, some of the younger kids are either afraid to come because of the virus or some are just trying to collect the unemployment, you know? Yeah. So, it, when we open indoors, we can do reservations. I think that'll work. But outdoors right now, it's so limited. And we're just trying to get a flow. We're just trying to open, be good to the public, provide a good service, 
be in a clean environment. But we want to get a feel for what's going to happen. Just like when the first day, when on the 17th, when they announced our first takeout, we were adjusting daily. We were moving computers, adding a phone line. And that's what's going to happen here with restaurants. And we're kind of communicating with each other. And, you know, my most important thing right now is the sanitation end of it. And, you know, I won't sacrifice the customer or my staff just to sell another dollar. You know, so so uh, we are doing takeout only and we're allowing you to eat it on the takeout. I I want to get a feel for this for a few days before I start actually serving you on the patio with plates and silverware and glassware. So how the customer is going to give us that feedback, we'll know immediately how they're feeling. And that's why I'm taking those few days this weekend to understand and get a feel. And I'm in touch with most of the rest of many of the restaurants in town. You know, especially, you know, I, I, I constantly, uh, Julio's, Leo's, Rat Skeller, Maggie's, um, and, and uh, Mad Greek and those guys. So I'm constantly, we're, we're a small circle of just kind of getting information out to each other. So right. We yeah, caught a not everybody's doing the same thing, right? I mean, every, some, are, some are taking it slow, like you're saying, waiting and, waiting and seeing. Others are ready to pull the trigger tomorrow, would you say? Um... If anybody's ready tomorrow, I don't think I don't think they're being honest with themselves because they don't know what's actually coming. And to 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 look me a 30 year operator and say you're ready and, and, and that all your staff is going to put on gloves and and put on masks and everybody's going to be 100 percent. I don't know how you know, I think everybody needs to take a step back and and just take it easy like a like a soft grand opening again. That's the way my buddy described it from Texas Roadhouse because he has information from other Roadhouse and he said. Don't don't understaff because people are going to come, but you have to be ready for this new norm. That's going to be the sanitation, constantly changing gloves. Everything is going to flow a little slower because of this. Things are going to slow you up that you normally didn't have. Right. So. I, I'm, I think one of the curiosities I have is, is if a customer does come in and they're sitting down and they're, you know, having table service um, and therefore they're eating there, how do they keep a mask on. <laughs> I mean, it's impossible. You can't eat with a mask on unless you just keep taking it off of one ear, taking a bite, closing back up. Um, we're, so we're, I've, I've heard I've heard one restaurant, uh, I think it was I, I think it was in Hong Kong. And I heard about it, that they have little uh, like paper sacks that are the setting on each table. And the idea is you take it off, you stick your mask in the little paper sack, you eat your food and then you take it back out and put it back on again. So it never touches the table. Um, you know, they don't just stick in their pocket. They just, that, that, that's just set there for them. Um, I don't know. Again, we'll, we'll get a feel for that instantly. Um, we're going to ask the customers to keep their mask on when they address the staff oh, sure. and our staff members, uh, have, uh, markings to stand. So they just get into the habit of walking to the table and being away from the table again, but that can create another problem. You have somebody who doesn't hear well. And the first thing both of the parties are going to do is naturally lean towards each other. Right. Uh, right. So. Yeah, not not easy. It's it, like you said, it's it's going to be a gradual thing. Now, you mentioned uh, the website surfsafe.com where they have the, the video. Is that also the site that has um, where you can order up the training that you spoke of that used to be one hundred seventy five dollars? It's free. To yes. It's, yes, it's, it's a safe. great it, it, it's a great program. I mean, just to see it free was, was a gift from uh, from SurfSafe and uh, SurfSafe nationally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I typed that in uh, for our guests that are watching. I I typed it into the meeting chat. Um, if you're not, if you don't have your chat box open, um, uh, on your toolbar uh, it says converse, hide conversation or show conversation. And uh, so I typed that website in there. That's also where uh, if you're listening, you want to type in any questions that you may have. That's an option for you. Uh, or you can use the raise your hand function when we get to the Q&A and you can just uh, unmute and ask us. Um, all right, Andy, we'll, uh, I'm sure that some folks will have some questions for you, um, but it, if, um, if, if, if that's all for the moment, I'll, I'll move on to, to Rob. Great. Okay. So uh, with us uh, today, we have a uh, Southbury resident and now business owner in town, Rob Laban. He owns uh, Southbury Self Storage. Uh, but of course, he has a, a legacy with uh, Lebon's Markets, and I asked him to join us today because, of course, they have been open throughout this pandemic. And I thought, um, you know, rather than sort of the blind leading the blind, what if we talk to somebody who's kind of living and breathing this every day 
to help inform what your place might want to do to prepare uh, for in indoor guests. So uh, take it away, Rob. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Andy, I just want to say we, my wife and I love your, your restaurant. We got pick up from the Southbury location the past two weeks in a row. We, we can't resist some good Mexican food. Um, and also I want to second the serve safe course. I didn't know about their, their 13 minute COVID video, but we also send all of our employees, all of our food service employees and anyone who's a manager through their, their course. And, um, similar to that, we actually hold ours at Nogtuck Valley. They have a, a culinary program there, and one of their teachers uh, is a serve safe instructor. And we'll just we'll send like very similar twenty people at a time to go do the course. Um, and I've done it myself. It's it's definitely very eye opening. I think anyone would benefit from it just because you don't realize all that goes into food safe food preparation from you know uh, how fast things need to be heated and cooled and storage temperatures and time and duration. So I definitely recommend that. Um, in terms of the whole COVID situation, I mean, we were right in the middle of it. And the, I mean, the absolute craziest time was the first, I'd say week or so before anyone knew what was going on and our stores were just absolutely inundated um, doing you know, four times the normal volume and with no limits in the store, not really knowing how to handle it. That first week was just an absolute chaos. Uh, you know, it, it, that really burned our people out. There was no, no leaving work. It was just all hands on deck 24 um, seven. But the big turning point was uh, it, it wasn't the screens in front of the cashiers. It wasn't the mess. It wasn't the gloves. The biggest turning point for us was the limits in the store. So in three of our stores, we have four locations and three of them, we have a limit of 20 people in the store at one point in time, 20 customers. And then in the bigger one, it's a limit of 30 customers. And what that did is it just depressurized the whole situation. There was never a line anywhere. There was never like, you know, there was no, nobody frantic. There was nobody, there was no crowds in a certain part of the store. And that is what really kind of diffused the whole uh, situation. In addition to that, once we put up, um, we were, before the state even recommended it, we had Lexan, we went to Home Depot, bought a bunch of Lexan panels. Uh, we put panels on the front side of all the cash registers. And then on the back side of the cash registers, we actually built like a PVC uh, tubing system and put clear shower curtains up. So the cashiers are fully enclosed on either side. And then in our service deli and meat counters, we have big uh, clear plastic curtains that hang over the whole counter from the, the top of the deli counter that go to the ceiling. Uh, so that they can work behind the counter and then go to the end and hand the product over so that there's no, you know, pass through there. Um, we were also the first in the state to mandate or before the state required it, we were requiring masks and gloves for all of our employees. Um, I believe it or not, the person that we buy our walkie talkies from in New Jersey, he was the one that had a connection to China and we were able to get a bunch of masks in at a pretty reasonable price early on and we're, we still have uh, leftover of those. Um, after that, we started doing um, required temperature checks for customers. And that is, was probably the most dramatic uh, event that we did. You know, I think when we posted that picture on Facebook with no promoting or anything, almost 80,000 people have interacted with that post uh, because it was before the government mandated it. So people just were up in arms. I mean, I'd say it was 90%, 95% positive people like, Oh my God, this is amazing. And we have gained so many new friends and fans because of this whole thing. But uh, there was definitely a small percentage of people who were like infuriated. And, you know, you have to encounter those people at the door. They come in thinking, you know, I don't have to deal with this, but they don't realize it's private property and they don't have a, a you know, a right to be there. We, they, welcome on our property um, but if they don't want to follow the rules similar similar to you know forever it's been you know no shirt no shoes no service that's a old time thing but this time is you know if you don't want your temperature checked or you're not wearing a mask same thing you know you're welcome to shop somewhere else but throughout this whole thing we've been prioritizing the health of our customers and our employees you know, over sales and profits and uh, just up until last week we've been closed on sundays just to give an extra day to spread labor out um, and speaking on the labor front, 
when this whole thing happened, the initial craziness, uh, we had quite a few employees who were either at risk or just didn't feel comfortable or lived with family members who were at risk. And they decided to step back. And we had some leave for as long as a month. We have some that are still stepped out of work. And it's no questions asked. Absolutely, you got to do what's best for you. But we've also had quite a few who did step back now come back to the store because they've seen everything we've done from you know beating the government to having the mask required in the store, the temperature checks, the shields, um, you know, the social distancing. And they've said, you know, when this all first started, I really wasn't comfortable. But because of all the measures you have in place now, I do feel comfortable coming back to work. So I would say um, probably three quarters of the employees who had left because they didn't feel comfortable are now actually back because they feel better about working. So, yeah, so keeping the uh, the employees uh, feeling safe on the job is is has been key. Yeah. Yep. Let me ask you about the temperature checks real quick, uh, Rob. When you say you have your guests, you know, your visitors coming through having their temperature. How is that handled? How, how do you actually do it? Is that- um, so when this whole thing kicked off, we had a feeling this would be coming. My, my father has really been on the pulse of this all. Um, he's been you know, staying up till two in the morning watching YouTube videos before anyone was ever concerned about it here in the U.S. Um, and he he noticed that in China that all the measures they were doing, he's like, we're probably going to need uh, infrared thermometers. So at the time, this was, you know, after the craziness struck, we ordered them on Amazon and it was just kind of a shot in the dark, you know, hopefully they come in and we ordered two per store and they're just like a, a trigger style infrared thermometer that you can hold six inches away from someone's forehead and it gives you an accurate temperature reading. Um, and it's just enough to, to, you know, basically know if someone has a fever or not. And I think since this whole thing has started, we've maybe had to turn away four people. And with the people who actually did run a fever, they were actually uh, very grateful. Like, oh, wow, like, thank you. I, I didn't know. Right. And, you know, they were concerned for themselves and it was they were appreciative. Um, we have had a, a handful of customers who have been, you know, irate that we've had to kick out or threaten to call the police over and, you know, try to you know, start something with the person watching the door. And so we just have zero tolerance for it. And all the police officers in our town are very supportive and they, and they, jump right over as soon as we need to. But um, we see that less and less and less now just because it's it's the new normal. And if you're coming into the store and you're surprised by the fact that you need to be wearing a mask or have your temperature taken, taken you've probably been living under a rock for the past two months. So, Yeah. One of our, <clears throat> one of our listeners uh, has written that they think it's uh, uh, www.serve, S-E-R-V-S-A-F-E.com. Um, and I, I had to add the E and serve. Um, so uh, whichever, whichever gets you there is the, is the one to use for the, uh, for that, uh, that site. Thank you for that. Um, before I, uh, mm-hmm. ask a couple questions of my own here, uh, just to kind of wrap this up, let me, uh, again, open it up to our group. Um, I know, uh, one of our listeners that's joining us is, uh, is, is Becky, Becky Butler. Do, Becky, do you feel like unmuting and asking your question directly? I know you had one earlier for us. Yeah. Hi. Um, We have Arts Escape in town and we're more a school. We're not a restaurant. So all the guidelines that are coming through are for everything but a school because public schools are all closed, but we're a little bit different. So I'm very hesitant as how to open because my population is basically 65 and older. Gotcha. So um, let me ask uh, uh, the gentleman on the call here. if, if either of them would like to, to chime in, it's I, I would assume that the measures that, that you're taking in uh, in the markets, Rob, and, and also the the measures that you're about to take and have been taking, Andy, uh, are, are similarly a- applicable. But um, have you given any additional thought to, um, as Becky's saying, we do have, in her case, a fair amount of seniors because of just who is populating and using the services. But one can't deny. I mean, in in Southbury, it's 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 very um, front of mind as we have the highest senior population in the entire state of Connecticut. Um, so, have there been any additional measures that you've taken that, in, in thinking of that, and or 
have you noticed um, you know a, a drop off let's say in participation from folks coming out because of the fact that they're a little bit more worried uh, just see if you can speak to that a little bit I personally relate to the seniors I think it's kind of a mixed bag you have some that are very afraid but I almost feel like the majority aren't as fearful as they should be uh, I feel like the general attitude from a lot of them is this is kind of ridiculous. It's overbearing. It's kind of, you know, pushing on my rights. I don't really agree with it. So I, I would actually like to see seniors be a little more cautious from what we've seen in the stores. They're, they're almost too comfortable. Um, you know, we're, we're, um, we're personally requiring my grandparents. We don't let them go out and do their own shopping and stuff. We bring everything to them, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, if you're targeting a senior base, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a long line of people waiting to get back out of their house. I just think a lot of them, you know, they're, they're kind of like not overly concerned, but then you also have the you know, percentage of them who are very concerned and they haven't left their house since this whole thing began. So it's a, really a toss up. What about, what about you, Andy? You're, you're still muted. That, that, that conversation uh, started coming up weeks ago with uh, Janet and Chris from the Rat Scatler and Bobby from Leo's. I don't do the biggest, I don't do a big lunch. I'm really a, a strong dinner restaurant. Yeah, we do lunch, but Bob and Janet at, uh, at Leo's and the Rat, they have a very strong senior uh, push for, for, you know, throughout the day and uh, early dinner. They're very, very concerned that their senior population is not going to come out. So again, I don't think they're going to run out on Wednesday, but I think eventually as time goes on, they'll feel more comfortable. I think, you know, going to, to Le Bon's is, is easier for a senior, especially with some of the restricted hours that they have early on, like some of the supermarkets have done. I don't know if you guys did that, Rob, but um, I can't, you know, I think we're going to get hurt the restaurant industry, because I don't think seniors are going to be out nowhere like they used to. They, they still are going to be. The last thing a senior needs to be is eating next to a group of four 20 year old kids who are just screaming and yelling and having a good time and on their phones. And, you know, uh, it, it time will tell like everything else with this with this crisis. It's just adjust, adjusting and going to places again, like I said before, that makes you feel comfortable and protects if that population needs extra protection, what are we going to do to protect them and give them that comfort zone to say, hey, go to Poncho's. We went there. They, they, they'll put us in a back room by ourselves and, you know, you can get a nice meal. And, you know, when time when when we do open inside. Um, right. But it's all it's all, you know, we're adapting day to day. Yeah. And maybe, you know, to your point, uh, obviously taking all these measures is critical, but um, is is getting a sense of what they're looking for. And, uh, you know, one thing, Becky, maybe I can ask, uh, you know, our senior services uh, director and 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 find out some of the feedback that maybe we're getting um, uh, from specifically from that population of what what they're looking for to, to feel comfortable, you know, coming back. Um, obviously, you're going to do all the measures that are required. Uh, of you, but uh, but maybe it's it is it's going above and beyond. And then how how is that communicated? How do, how do people know about it? You know, and uh, and that that brings me to one last point uh, that I don't think we really talk too much about is is signage, um, both both in the markets and uh, and and in the restaurants, um, and in all of our shops. I mean, directional arrows, things like that. If you could both just sort of quickly touch on the the importance of of signage because everything's going to be about communication. Uh, with getting people to do what you need them to do when they're in your establishment. Um, on the uh, on the directional arrows front, I I personally think they're not really necessary, especially once we put the limits in the store. Um, we we have them because they're required. I would say a lot of customers don't even notice them. You know the arrows on the floor, and the reality is if you have a small enough number of people in the store, there's oftentimes not even someone in the aisle. So it's going a certain direction doesn't really make much of a difference. Um, and then you get to a certain point where there is no possibility to have directional arrows because it's just a congregation point. Um, so yeah. And then signage is definitely important. We have our own graphic designer on staff and she is making new signs every week as we're changing our hours, adding hours, shortening hours, do new requirements. So that's been a huge help. Um, and it's, it's often something for the employees to reference. 
So as someone's coming in, it's they can point to the sign, you know, as they're checking their temperature and say, you know, don't forget next week, this is going to be changing. So that's helpful. Um, you know, signs are important. A lot of times they aren't red. So make them big, bold and uh, like a billboard, like you're driving 100 miles an hour and need to get them pointing across really quickly. Right. Um, Andy, one thing I listened to a podcast recently, it was a, a Tim Ferriss podcast, and he interviewed uh, Nick, C- Nick Kakonis, who owns the Alinea Group. I guess they're in uh, like Chicago and New York City. And this guy, Nick, he created a software company called Talk. And that, their website is exploretalk.com. And they have an interesting business model where you, I guess, pay for your reservation. And then when you show up, you get a credit. And I was thinking for you with seating being so limited, if someone were to call and make a reservation and not show up, that's even more of a hit for you now. And this service might be valuable. Um, so I could send you a link to that, that uh, podcast after if you want. Please. Um, Kathy, on this uh, last topic of, of, of signage and, uh, and, and what you and I had talked about uh, earlier that we um, had seen other towns and cities exploring um, who, you know, other businesses, let's say, for example, retail, who might want to have more outdoor presence with their merchandise. Uh, or, as you said, signs are being popping up left and right, Rob. So, you know, typically there's a there's a very stringent, you know, enforcement policy with regards to temporary signs. So we're trying to, as a town, look at the areas that we can do, what we can do to help businesses be nimble and adapt to some of these things. Um, and so we, we've been interested in, uh, in finding out from the public, and, and I'm going to ask it here. I know there's not a whole lot of people on the call, but if, you, if you're watching this afterwards, uh, to contact us if you, know, if you have uh, needs uh, that are sort of outside the norm, let's say, of, of doing business. And uh, you know, it's already being addressed with the outdoor dining, um, those that don't have it, making it easy to, uh, for them to get it, and for those that do have it, expand it and alter it. But uh, this might extend to to other types of businesses, you know, like I said, retail, for example, uh, having, you know, part of their merchandise outside. So it's it's safer and it's, it's easier to to uh, to notice that it's that they're open and for business. So, um, Kathy, I don't know if you had anything else you want to add on that at this time. I think I think we don't know what the demand really is for that or or. I think if, if a business wants to put some of their merchandise outside and they currently don't do that or they have never been permitted to do that, give us a call and we'll see what we can figure out. And if we need to get into more permitting, we'll, we'll work on that. But if we don't, you know, we don't want to add another layer of um, approval that's not necessary. Exactly. Um, thanks for that uh, uh, web link, uh, Rob, to, that you spoke of. And, um, and after this is over. I'm going to, you know, send out a, a one sheet that kind of touches on everything we talked about and with and with the links to. Um, that, that podcast too, Kevin, is really relevant to all restaurant owners. It's specifically on the COVID crisis, and actually, this his restaurant group had their highest day of sales ever um, during the COVID crisis because of how they handled their takeout process. Um, they took a unique approach to it and um, have actually thrived throughout this whole thing. So it's definitely worth listening to if you're in the restaurant industry. Great. Great. Um, so in the last few minutes we have left, let me just uh, again ask if anybody has a has a question. You can either use the raise the hand function and uh, and I'll and I'll call in you. That's that little hand there on your toolbar or, or you can type it into the uh, the conversation line if you if you uh, are shy and you don't want to ask it <laughs> out loud. Um, so while I uh, while I wait and look for that, let me just uh, uh, ask our our guests if they had any 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 final thoughts on this uh, topic that either uh, you didn't cover or you just want to sort of hammer home um, as we as we wrap up. So I'll start with you, Andy. Um, again, I just everything seems to be going back to sanitation. Again, we it, it, to answer to go further on Becky's question, it was make make the people feel comfortable and protect the, the the public protect your staff and I think things will flow slowly and get better and and the more time we give it the, the better off you know we're doing with the government the CDC the testing and everything is just flows in place and we don't have another you know my fear personally is that there's a second wave coming because we don't do the right things 
That's my biggest fear. You know, I, I really can't. I closed the store for for 14 days. It, it was it was a, it was a huge loss of sales and all the product that we ended up throwing out. You know, I, I got sick in uh, in mid March, and to protect my staff, I had to quarantine everybody. But that's my biggest fear. Is you know, if, if somebody else gets sick, I, I got to do the right things. Now they got all these uh, companies that are out there disinfecting in, in, in 24 hours and fogging the place. And and they're doing those kind of services. You know, everybody's jumping in on whatever they can. But right, yeah. but, but make the customer, make the employees feel safe. And like, uh, you know, like Rob says, they'll come back to work if they feel safe. I had, I had people stop in that didn't want to work. And same thing to Rob's point. Once they saw how we were masked, glove, you know, I had I had ten sanitizing stations throughout the restaurant. That's a lot in a, in a in a thirty two hundred square foot footprint to have ten places you can just turn and spray your hands or, or wash your hands, you know. Um, and they they looked around. They said, "Oh, this is this is not as bad as I thought," you know. Well, I said to them, "You haven't been here in a month and a half. How how would you know? We've been dying over here for people." So. They both decided to come back to work. So, again, make them feel safe. I think you know we'll we'll get through this together. Absolutely, uh, Rob. Any clo closing thoughts? Yeah, um, I, I forgot to mention that our person who's taking temperatures when they come in the door, they're also uh, they personally wipe down every single cart that comes in the building. So every the first impression when someone walks in is like, wow, these people are on top of their game. They're not only checking my temperature, they're making sure the first thing I touch is, has been cleaned. Um, and, uh, also I, I want to warn that my mother who is a nurse and she's been working in the ICU at Charlotte Hungerford, she has cautioned everyone that gloves can give people a false sense of comfort. Um, and this is definitely true, especially for, you know, departments or, you know, businesses that are not used to wearing them. And the gloves aren't meant to protect the wearer. They're meant to keep whatever you're touching clean. So that means you got to be willing to change them and throw them away often. Um, and if you're changing your gloves often, that means you don't have to wash your hands as often. I mean, washing hands is important, but if you always have a clean pair of gloves on, you're staying clean. Um, and so my mother, who is, who's seen the worst of this in the ICU at Charlotte, um, you know, has, has really pushed that. And she, she truly feels that the masks are the most important thing because if everyone's wearing a mask, that means the sick people are wearing a mask and then they're not spreading it. So the masks are important. You got to be careful that uh, we're constantly reminding people that it can't be tucked below your nose or above your chin. It's got to fully cover your nose and your chin. Um, so that way, if you cough or sneeze, you're not sharing your germs with everyone else. All righty. Well, um, I think that, uh, you know, each business is um, obviously interested not only in, uh, in their survival, but in the, the safety of their employees and, of course, the safety of the, uh, of the guests that are going to be coming there. And um, I, know, I know everyone's going to do you know, everything they can to, uh, to make it as, as, as safe an environment as possible um, to make, to make the, this a success and for this to work. Um, so I'm sure folks that uh, hear this will appreciate uh, the, the, guides, the guidelines that you've laid out, uh, both of you. Uh, to make that uh, successful for their business. Um, I'm sure they're well under the way in, in preparation. Um, it's going to be baby steps, but we'll uh, we'll all get there and eventually, uh, you know, things will be back in, into swing and we'll get, you know, it's going to be, a, it's going to take some time, but um, one day at a time we'll, we'll get through it. So uh, this has been our second reopening South Ferry uh, webinar. Um, we're going to have one uh, next week uh, that's going to be focused on um, the forgiveness part of the PPP. Um, a lot of folks, about uh, half of those that took the survey, uh, the town survey, uh, said that they did uh, file and receive the PPP. So I know there's going to be a lot of interest in folks being uh, sure that uh, they're getting uh, forgiveness possible uh, and doing the right record keeping, et cetera. So we're going to talk about that. Um, and if you've got an idea for a topic you'd like to hear, please uh, email me and let me know. Um, if you have any follow-up questions for our guests as well, you can send those along. I'll make sure uh, they get asked and answered. And I uh, thank you for your attention and thank everybody for participating uh, on the call. Uh, my presenters, uh, Rob and uh, Kathy and Andy, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, take care. Thanks, Good luck. Take care. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Rob, send that link, all right? 
Will, you got it already. All right, everybody stay safe. All right, take care. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Kathy is now exiting.